Okay, thank you, Dave. So we are going to start with our second research seminar. Um, so Axel is doing a round two um, on the Ising game and talking about crit critical phenomenon and non-equilibrium equilibrium dynamics. Um, thank you, Axel, and I will pass the mic to you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So the so first, so, yeah. So this is kind of a part two of the first talk I gave. So it's like it can be useful to refresh that. So I'll go very quickly over some of the concepts from there. But uh, yeah, you can go back to that. Uh, right. So, so 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 in the first talk, I was kind of introducing these concepts of like what would a phase transition even mean in a kind of game theory context and like the the common statistical physics methods don't really directly apply to it. And it was about introducing this, these ideas. But now this uh, round is like, let's actually look at a simple toy model and probe for phase transitions and this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so, so this is a, a very simple model, but actually you'll see a lot of rich phenomena com comes out of it. Uh, uh, right, which and by the name is is the model is just inspired by the easing model of physics, which I'll talk about a little bit here. Uh, so, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So this is a review of of last time. So so what is what are the common tools of statistical physics? What is statistical physics? So, uh, and here, for instance, we'll talk about the easing model, which is basically a model for something like this. Like you have some lattice, and in each lattice side there is some little arrow. So this models like the magnetic uh, spin of some atom there. And right, so if all the spins are aligned, then your whole thing is like a magnet with an overall magnetic field and so on. So, so it's a model of these little arrows in a lattice. And in the Ising model, it's even simpler that these arrows could either point up or point down. Right? So they can't go like this, but the arrows have the option of just pointing up or pointing down. And basically, in the, uh, you have an energy function which tells you uh, if it 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 takes lower energy if the spins are aligned, so that's like fair amount the spins want to align, and you could also have some external field or something. Right, so you say there's this external field that wants uh, the spins to align in this particular direction, depending on the sign of J here. Uh, right, so, so so in physics you have an energy function, so you have some configuration of the spins uh, up and down, however, and that has some energy. Then what you do in statistical physics is like you want, uh, so you can talk about a partition function, which is basically a weighted sum of all the possible configurations of uh, spins up and down. And these are weighted by, uh, by the, their temperature here, by the temperature here. So uh, yeah, so this is a parameter that you put here to that basically tells you how much weight do higher energy configurations have. So obviously the, now, the most important contribution here would be like the lowest energy here. That's a kind of so, so it's a theory of a ground state. We call it the lowest energy configuration plus fluctuations of higher energy around it. Uh, then uh, right, so we have actually physical physical observable things which are expectation values. And so you say okay, so what? So what's the expected value I will see of a particular spin here? Well, I, do I expect to see it up or down or what's, 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 what's the expected value? And how you do that is like, you, so you have your, the thing you want to observe and you basically average it with this distribution, which is weighted by that. And this is, so this is actually the definition of temperature. Right? So temperature is just that. It's like, how much do you weight uh, other states in the partition function? Now, uh, so that's physics. Um, then, so this is what I introduced last time. So, what can we, what is, can we look at similar to this in uh, in uh, game theory? So, uh, so we so an important point here is like so an important point in physics when you talk about phys uh, about critical phenomena is uh, locality. Right? So, this energy function has some lo notion of locality with it. So the idea is that the a given spin interacts more strongly with the spins that are closest to it. And in this Ising model in particular, this is just an interaction between nearest neighbors. And so the direct interaction is between near, nearest neighbors. And it's assumed that there's no direct interaction with a spin that is very far away. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so, so we're gonna look at some like uh, many agent uh, or many many player uh, game theory, where there's some sense of locality where like my utility is more dependent more strongly with players that are in some notion of distance closer to me, right? and uh, uh, but and and then the analogy of this thermodynamic noise here given by the temperature will be like deviations from rationality right so uh right? so you have like the, the stable configuration is like you have everyone being perfectly rational and you're in a Nash equilibrium and then you add a little noise which can be parameterized uh, and uh, to deviate around this uh this equilibrium right? so what you have is like a set of strategies for all the given for so this is the strategy for the eighth player and uh, so a one shot here means that like the game will be only played once. Right? So so you don't collaborate with anyone, and you have to come up with your strategy alone, and you place your strategy. And then everyone, every player has their own utility, but their utility depends more strongly on what the strategies of the players around the given player was. Right? So this is what this notation is here. Yeah. And then you have like well, when everyone is rational, you would have a Nash equilibrium where uh, right, so, so it's a particular configuration of, of spins that is basically the best that non cooperating players can do. Uh, now, you introduce uh, this idea of noise introspection, which is uh, also kind of the analogy of statistical physics here. Where, okay, so, so, so let's assume I am less than rational so what what's the um right, so what's the the expected strategy that that i would have right so, so if i i say if i'm not doing exactly the nice equilibrium strategy but i have some noise around it and this can be modeled by some temperature parameter here uh, so this should be actually one over t here but anyway uh right so the idea is uh so this is this is done by many levels. So at the first level, I say, okay, so let's assume all my neighbors are doing the Nash strategy, and I will weigh my strategy, the, uh, right, with something similar to the statistical physics weight here. Uh, right. So, so the the highest contribution will come from the Nash equilibrium strategy here, but I accept fluctuations coming from other uh, uh, from other strategies. Here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so I sum over all my possible strategies weighted like this. And this would be my expected strategy at the first order of, uh, at the first level of introspection. Uh, but then if I'm, uh, uh, if, I, if I'm more rational like that, I, I assume also my neighbors are doing the same, right? So, so this is the first level that they're doing Nash, but then those neighbors are also not perfectly rational and doing a noisy introspection around their neighbors doing nice strategy and so on. Right? So, so, so the second round is like assuming my neighbors are also doing this kind of statistical approach and then I do a statistical approach on top of that. And then these ones are doing a statistical approach. And so you can do n levels of introspection and then like kind of your, your actual expected value would be the limit of like infinite levels of introspection. Uh, this in principle could involve like many parameters here, like they could have different temperatures at different levels, but for most of the talk, we'll just put the same parameter here to like describe that everyone at every level has the same amount of noise. Uh, yeah. All right, so, so this is the kind of thing that, that we're looking at this time. So, so, so instead of looking at energy functions, we're looking at utilities for individual players. And instead of thermal noise, we're looking at this n levels of noise introspection around uh, Nash equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, right. So this is the kind of things that we know about phase transitions in physical systems that we ask, like, well, we're gonna go see something like this in uh, game theory or something. So one thing is like, so this is a, a, a thing that is well understood only in equilibrium statistical physics. Uh, which means uh, so so this is like when you're modeling statistical physics, like I described, this is something that is the system is not changing. You're modeling at this particular temperature, and there's no other like forces or changing things on it. Uh, 
So something that happens in statistical physics is that uh, you have like divergent correlation lengths, right? So, so, so close to a critical point, more and more and more distant spins in this easing model will be correlated with each other. Right? So the, the correlation length there starts to diverge close to a critical point. And that means it's uh, anyway you can you, you can describe it with some critical exponents or some matter mass. And right, so generally what uh, there's like a, the phase transition happens between an ordered and a disordered phase. Like for instance, in the easing model here, this means that if you look at the expected value of a given spin, uh, so this would be the order parameter here, which means that the order parameter is something that in one phase has expected value of zero, and in another phase has a non-zero expected value. So if you are in a low temperature phase here, so you expect that the spins actually can get aligned, so the expected value for a given spin will be non-zero. But if fluctuations are very high and you're in a disordered phase, then expected value for any given spin will be zero because it can be up and down and they're not aligning the spins. Uh, so that's kind of the magnetization, demagnetization transition. So if you take a magnet and you heat it hot enough, you will lose the magnet because the spins will not be aligned anymore. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so something interesting is that there's an order of a phase transition. Right? So, so, so you can ask, like, what is the, what is the, of what order is my phase transition? And because the point is, there is some discontinuity happen at that transition point. Uh, so in physics, this usually happens. Like you can talk about the behavior of of this order parameter, for 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 instance, as I increase the temperature. And the idea is, so if I'm uh, so, so if I'm increasing the temperature and I look at how this order parameter behaves, some derivative of this order parameter with respect to the temperature will be discontinuous. Right? So in a first order trans phase transition, the derivative of this guy is discontinuous as I cross that, that uh, the thing. But anyway, so that's uh, that. Now, uh, this is a, a, a simple case we physicists uh, uh, really love, which is the async model because it's like simple to play with and, and see ideas. But we don't really love the one D async model that much because it's kind of too simple. Right? So this is uh, so what you can do here is okay. So let's let's look at the one D async model, which is I take these spins and just put them on a line. So I have a line of spins and the nearest neighbors interact. So this spin interacts with one ahead and one behind. Right? Here, in this case, I am removing the external magnetic field. Uh, uh, doesn't matter much, but just looking at, at the interaction between spins. And uh, something you can you can ask is, like, say you are at some, you're looking at this model at some given temperature. Are you going to be in an ordered phase or a disordered phase? Right? So for a certain temperature, will the spins be able to align? or the thermal fluctuations be too high and you won't be able to align the spins despite they wanting to be aligned. And so this model is nice in that you can do this exactly, right? So, so this is your energy function. You calculate your partition function here and basically you can just sum over all possible states. So you take these spins and yeah, they are plus and minus one. You can do all these sums and do this carefully. And uh, by the end, this is your partition function here. You can write it like this. And you can also write a uh, compute exactly things like correlation functions. Right? So let me look at the correlation function of a given spin versus a spin that is R lattice sites away. Right? And then you get this correlation function and you can, uh, so, so it looks like this, like this exponential. And which means you can easily write it in terms of some correlation length here. So this lets you kind of easily look for a phase transition if this correlation length diverges at some point. And uh, the, so the one DC model is nice in that you can calculate it exactly like this, but it's not nice in that you, it's not very rich. So you calculate it like this, and what you see is that there isn't a phase transition. So, uh, so there isn't a change of behavior in this guy here. And uh, so the only really phase transition happens only with, at, at exactly zero temperature. So what this means is that in the 1D easing model, for any finite temperature that you have, 
you will not be able to align the spins. They, they can only align at exactly zero temperature. And this is a feature of the 1D. This is different in 2D, but uh, we're not going to get there. But in 1D, as soon as you introduce a little bit of temperature, you lose the, the alignment. Uh, yeah. Now, let's talk about game theory. So we can write down something inspired by the Ising model. So this is the guy we're going to be playing with. And this is what I call the Ising game. So the idea is, is a similar thing. So you have n number of players in one dimension. Right? So they are aligned in a line. Each player has possible strategies of just plus and minus one. This is the, the play they can make. They can either choose plus one or minus one. And their utility for, for that uh, game depends only on what their nearest neighbors do. Right? So if my strategy aligns with my neighbor to the right, that's good, and if it aligns with the neighbor to the to the left, that's also good, yeah. and I win this this number of utility. I can also put what I call here an external incentive, which means that I say if this is positive, this will favor uh, using the strategy plus one. Yeah. Uh, right. So so player wins by aligning with their neighbors and also by aligning with external uh, uh, incentive. Uh, and in particular, if uh, if uh, if this since if this J is positive, then there's a clear Nash equilibrium where like the the best strategy for everyone to do is everyone just choose plus one, right? And this is the best they they can do in a one way. Right? So everyone chooses plus. So if, if everyone is rational, everyone chooses plus one with with this external incentive. Uh, so now. Sorry, I took something here with this one. Okay. Uh, all right, so a couple of questions we want to look at here. So, so let's say every, everyone is rational, everyone chooses plus one. What if people started being non-rational? Right, so we see in the in the easing model, as soon as you introduce a little bit of noise, this order is destroyed. Right, so by restoring symmetry here, I mean like symmetry between plus and minus one. Right, so this order is destroyed and uh, players can equally do plus or minus one. So, so, so how much noise is required to kind of uh, uh, destroy this order? And uh, another question is like, okay, so we have this Nash equilibrium kind of uh, incentivized there by this external incentive that pushed everyone to choose plus one. What if I then remove this incentive? Will this be stable or like so? so will they? Uh, Keeping this uh, all aligned, or when I remove that, will I lose that uh, alignment? As is the case in the one D easing model, if I remove the field, so I, I can align all this all the spins if I introduce an external field, but if I remove it, then I lose the right, kind of this magnetization. Um, right. So this this is we can calculate this, right? So we can start doing noise introspection of this uh, easing game. So for the first level, this is pretty easy. So what I do is. I'm looking at the ith player, and I assume the two nearest neighbors are doing the Nash strategy, which is they're doing plus one. Yeah. And then I sum over all my possibilities around this Nash equilibrium. So I have a contribution from plus one and plus minus one. This, I can do this. And this is the this kind of partition function here. And the same way I can calculate a correlation function. But in this case, so this is something I discussed in the previous talk that these two guys are actually uncorrelated here. So this is the same as kind of calculating the expected value squared of one. Uh, anyway, this is stuff that I can do. And at the first level of introspection, it's easy to just, I just kind of have to sum over plus and minus one and get this time uh, attention. So this is what, uh, what I get, right? Now it's not to do, so, so this is something you, you can kind of keep doing now. The So I assume this is what, now for the second round, I, I assume this is what my neighbors do. And then I do noise introspection around that. Right? And then I do that n times. And what that result like, looks like is something like this, where my nth level of my expected value is looking like, like this, where I have similar looking to this, so tangent of, of this guy. But here I, I, I kind of uh, do more. I hide the complexity here in calling this guy D for uh, so, so kind of an effective uh, uh, number here. 
that is based on the previous one and the previous run and, and so on. So what this actually looks like is like a tangent inside a, inside a tangent, inside a tangent, inside a tangent. So it's kind of a very nested expression with n levels of tangent nested in there. Yeah. So this is what the Ising model with some given temperature n, uh, temperature t at the nth level of introspection looks like. And now I can, so I have this expression, I can calculate it now, I can start probing it like, okay, so are there different phases? Uh, do I see order and then, so I know I'm starting from the order of this Nash equilibrium as I'm pointing up. Will I break that at a specific amount of temperature or, or something like this? Uh, so first, kind of we can gain, gain some intuition by kind of looking at different limits. So first we can look at, like, let's say I am very close to rational. So let, that means, let me put a very small amount of temperature. So, so if I have, so, so if this T is very small, I am only slightly deviating from rational. Let's see what that looks like. And uh, so this is kind of a low temperature expansion. And this can be done because this tangent has a, a simple approximation where this t is uh, very small, then I can write it in terms of this exponential, and then kind of I put this inside the tangent in the, in the next uh, nested expression. And um, by the end, for small t's, this expression for uh, for uh, for this looks like this. Um, and this is simple to understand. So this is the the rational. So, so my expected value for strategy is the rational strategy, which would have been one, playing one, and start uh, deviating away from it by a small amount. So the more irrational I am, the less that I am likely to do. To, uh, to Actually, the more irrational everyone is. So not just me, but, but everyone. Uh, right. right. So 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 it looks like, uh, so, so at perfectly rational, I have my strategies one, and then I start deviating away from it. And that's a very sensible low temperature expansion. Now, the other end is let's look at a high temperature expansion. Right, so it's a similar thing. So I have this tangent expressions here, and this also have an approximation for very large values of temperature, which is basically I can approximate the tangent by its argument when, when the argument is very small. So I get this guy. And now when I have n levels of introspection of that, I have tangent in tan inside tangent inside tangent, I'll get something that is proportional to one to the t to the n. Now I am assuming here that temperature is large. So this is a number that will vanish to zero as I take n to infinity, right? As I take more and more introspection. So if temperature is high enough, my expected value will go to exactly zero. Right? So what I see is something that looks like an ordered phase and a disordered phase. So at low temperature, as expected, I have, uh, 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 so at low temperature, I have order. So I have something that is not exactly the, the perfectly rational strategy, but close to it. At some point in between, that breaks down and my strategy is indifferent between one and uh, minus one because everyone is so noisy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, zero, uh, zero temperature is perfectly rational. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. right. Translation of uh, right, so temperature. So, right, so, so temperature here is just some way I am parameterizing the how irrational people are. Right, so this is a way to to rational the. Try to parameterize the noise of like people are not perfectly rational, but are kind of random around rationality. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, okay. So so we so we establish kind of the limits makes sense. So at high at low temperature we have something, some non-zero expected value, some ordered value. That makes sense. At at large temperatures, this drops to zero. So kind of this plus minus one symmetry is restored. When does this change happen? Is there a point? Can we identify a point somewhere in between where this difference in behaviors happen? And you actually can. Right? So, so the idea here is that right, so so remember we have this kind of nested expression where we have a tangent inside a tangent inside a tangent. So 
kind of I start with the initial uh, parameter G here and put it in a tangent and then put that in another tangent and so on. So if it happens that when I take the initial, uh, when I take this thing and I put it inside a tangent, it becomes smaller every time. And then I put it in another tangent and then it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Then that thing will inevitably just go to zero when I do like a, a large end level of introspection. So the question is, is there a, is there a, a particular value of of temperature where this thing will start getting smaller and smaller such that it will lead to zero? And if it doesn't do that, then so so there's that point where where gn is smaller than gn minus one. When that happens, you have zero expectation value. So this is kind of when that phase transition happens and you can kind of uh, uh, solve this. And uh, anyway, so, so this is uh, the, the critical temperature you identify with this expression here. Uh, but so, so if my, if, if my temperature, if my temperature is lower than the one given here, I will have a finite, uh, a non-zero expected value for my strategy. But if I introduce a temperature higher than this, then uh, my strategy is just uh, uh, equally uh, plus and minus one. So yeah, so this is a phase transition and we identified the critical temperature which happens at this point. Now, there's something kind of cool so, here, which is, yeah. Can I just do a quick question? So if when you do infinite introspection, the rational decision is to pick zero, doesn't that mean that everyone will pick zero? And so you get symmetry as well? I think you phrased that wrong. So, so, so it's not that you, uh, that you did this introspection and the rational decision is zero. I mean, the rational decision is doing the nice strategy. It, the, the thing is that this is the best that you can do because you're not rational. Right? So you can do, so if, if, if there's enough noise and if you're irrational and everyone else is, is irrational, this is the, you can't do better than just be random. So it's like, okay. So you're so noisy that I don't know. Let me just choose whatever. Okay, got it. Yeah. No. Uh, okay. So, right. So, so this is what uh, the, the summary here. So I have these expected values here that, so at low temperature, it looks like something finite. So small deviations from one, from the rational thing. Then, uh, so, so, so it's smoothly decreasing from the rational thing. Then at some at some critical point, uh, after that critical point, it drops to zero. But this is the something that is peculiar here that is unlike physics. When this happens, usually in physics, you look at okay. So let me uh, so so let's say this expected value was decreasing from one, and if it was physics, it will decrease all the way to zero and then stay in zero. So that is actually, that would be a first order first uh, phase transition. And so the expected value is not discontinuous, but the derivative of it is. Yeah. Now, what we see here is actually a zero order phase transition, which is weird. Yeah. So, so it's decreasing from one, and then it reaches this critical point. At that point, its value, you can calculate it, and it's actually one fourth. And then after that, it drops immediately to zero. That's it. So the expected value itself is discontinuous as I change the temperature. Right? So it's a non-zero value, non-zero value, and then suddenly zero. So, so this is a, a kind of interesting thing that is on physics like, and this is a feature of, of this weird noise intros introspection here. It happens because of this nested structure like this. It's not gonna happen in, in, in physics. Uh, yeah, so that's, Kind of cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, so, so this this is about it for that. For so so this is kind of the so, so for the original questions we said to, to answer. This this is it. The the model is nice enough that it gave us a bit more, which we will see now. But uh, yeah, so these are the questions we we had from before, and yeah, so we can touch again on on the right, so the the questions that I asked before. So let's say, okay, so I aligned everyone with 
with this external incentive. And I can see now, okay, it's, it's, it's uh, everything is stable until I go beyond this temperature, right? But if I do that, and then I actually remove the external incentive, this still works, right? So this is still a finite, uh, a finite temperature. So, so yeah, so, so the idea is that unlike the 1D Ising model of physics, this uh, ordered phase is stable when I remove the incentive. So that's kind of cool also. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. uh, right, so, so if I do this with the Ising model, I introduce an external field, I kind of will get a critical temperature that depends on this external field. But if I remove the external field, that critical temperature goes to zero. Right? So, so any amount of noise will destroy that order. But here, uh, I can align everyone, then remove the field, and I can still have some order at some non-zero temperature. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, OK, so now we have that. And there's something kind of cooler that we can start looking at, which is, OK, so, so this was all uh, uh, like a one one round game where everyone just plays one. So you choose now plus or minus one, and that's it. The game is over. Uh, uh, but what if we had, let's say, two rounds? Right? So everyone plays once, and then uh, I can observe everyone's first round play, and then I play again. Uh, so something kind of I, I kind of sneaked in here is that in this one round game, if I want from the start to perfectly align everyone, I have to introduce this external incentive. So kind of once I have everyone aligned, I can actually remove it. But if 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 uh, so, if I'm just playing one round and I don't have this field, the the players don't know if they should choose plus or minus one. So. Aligning is better, but I don't know what everyone else will do. So I that choose randomly plus or minus one. So I so say if we don't have an external incentive, right, and we're doing this this first this two round game. In the first game, the only thing rational players can do is choose whatever plus plus or minus one. So with fifty percent, I'll choose plus one. Fifty percent, I'll choose minus one. There's I mean there's no reason to do anything else than that. Right? Uh, and then, right, so, so let's, so let's say the first round, everyone just draws from some random distribution and that's the first play. Then and for the second round, everyone observes what everyone else do and plays again. So can the, can the second round improve on this, right? So can they do better by the second round by, by, by looking at the first round? So this is kind of the, the question here. And uh, so, so the answer is yes by doing this noise introspection. Uh, but right, so, so what they would do is, uh, right, so these are the, the questions here. So like by the second round with some with, with some correlation among spins, uh, among strategies emerge, because at the first round they're just strategy, they're uncorrelated. And uh, uh, yeah, and will they do better, like getting closer towards some better equilibrium that favors them more? Uh, so what they need to do is so like so uh, yeah. So in this case, for the for the first round, everyone would just do some random strategy, but for the second round, they can do a noisy introspection, but where the starting point of that noisy introspection is the players, the, what, the strategies that were done in the first round. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you more what that means exactly. Uh, and for example, we will look at this guy here. So let's say, let's calculate the correlation function between a given player and a player that is uh, uh, two sides away, so, so two players away. Uh, so in the first round, these two players are just playing random. So this is just zero. Uh, they're uncorrelated, but by right. So by the second round, what I do is so I can start doing introspection. Right. So, so let me. So this is the first round here. The the first correlation is just zero. Uh, let's say for now that 
let's see what's the best that the players can do by the second round. The best that they can do is that say everyone is perfectly Russian. Right? So let's assume that everyone has temperature equal to zero. And they start doing noise introspection with temperature equal to zero. And so what that looks like is that I start, uh, I, so I'm gonna choose my next strategy doing noise introspection based on what my neighbors did in the first round with a temperature that is going to zero. So if I do that, and if I do just one level, the first level of introspection for that, so I just look at my neighbors and base my strategy on my nearest neighbors, I immediately increase the, the, the correlation length of this, the, the correlation function for the second step to one half, from zero to one half. So, so, so by just doing one level of perfectly rational introspection, by the next step, uh, these guys will be a lot more coordinated, right? And this is good because everyone's utility will go up if they're more likely to agree with each other. Uh, and this actually keeps increasing with with every level of introspection I do. Okay, so I do this for the nearest neighbors and then I do the next level, which will take into account the next to nearest neighbors. Um, so this, there's actually a nice simple formula that, that you can write for this. So, so let's say this is, so, so the, the second game for perfectly rational players will increase and increase the more levels of introspection everyone does. So let's say this is the probability that the strategy I of the player I and the player two steps away uh, for the second round of the game, the probability that those two players will align in the strategy, that they will be either both plus one or both minus one. Uh, and this is like for the nth level of introspection that they do. So if you look, for example, at the, at the first round of the game where they're just doing equally plus or minus one, the probability that they align is just one half. Because that's just randomly, they might align, they might not align. There's a one half chance, chance that they are aligned. But if they are doing this perfectly rational introspection level by level, this probability of alignment increases with every level of introspection. And this is a little formula that can be derived for it. So this is the probability they had for their previous step. And this is the, uh, actually this should be squared here. Never mind, but anyway. Uh, anyway, so you can calculate what is, if I do one more round of introspection, what would be my new probability of alignment? And you can calculate it and it keeps increasing, increasing, and increasing. So uh, the idea that is kind of, cool here is that in principle, perfectly rational players can reach perfect coordination by just the second round of the game by doing this noise introspection with zero temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a caveat to this, which is, uh, okay, so, so they can do this, but kind of this is a computation they have to do, right? So to do more and more noisy introspection, this is like kind of a calculation you have to do. So and uh, you kind of need infinite time to do this infinite introspection. Right? So, so it's kind of a, um, the more you do, the more computation you have to do, but uh, so more realistically, you would talk also about, okay, so they can play twice and how much time do they have before they need to play again? And that would limit uh, how good they can get. So, so the kind of how many levels of introspection they can do. Uh, uh, right, so this is for perfectly rational. And so, so the kind of cool thing here is that, that in this game, in principle, with an infinite amount of time between plays, they can perfectly coordinate by the by the next round of the game. Uh, uh, but then if you introduce temperature, right, so if you assume that not everyone is perfectly rational, then uh, right, so you can do this a similar kind of kind of procedure and you will see that this this probability of coordination will be slightly less than this previous formula that we have here. And again, a, a similar thing happens that if I reach a certain critical temperature, then actually no coordination is possible at all by the second round. Right? So, so perfectly rational plays, uh, players will perfectly coordinate by the next round. If they're less than rational, they will less than perfectly coordinate. But if I take this noisy enough, then it's impossible to coordinate 
basically no matter how many rounds they keep playing they will just not go there uh yeah, so that's uh yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. Axel, on the on the initial case where the temperature is zero, so the good strategy do you think would be after the first round just pick the majority? So would that like if you do infinite introspections? The majority doesn't really matter to you because the majority may be far away from you. And so so if I, so there's n players and the majority were pointing uh, were were plus one, but mm -hmm. my neighbors were actually minus one. Then mm -hmm. I should I should try to coordinate with my neighbors. I don't care what the majority did. But doesn't the infinite introspection mean that you are going like to the neighbors of the neighbors and the neighbors of the neighbors, and so, yeah, so, so in so the it, end, the limit should be the majority. It, it's a yes. So kind of it turns out agreeing with that. So uh, so yeah, kind of, but but. It's uh, I mean, so, so, so it comes about in a more local way. So, so, but yeah, I mean, so in the end, like something has to break the symmetry. Right? So, so for the first round, everyone is equally symmetrically plus and minus one, but uh, but as by the next round, that symmetry must be broken. Right? So everyone must be plus one or minus one. That will, I mean. Probably that will agree with what was the majority thing uh, uh, in the first round. Uh, right. So, uh, right. So, just just about it. Just to summarize here, what are the main uh, points here? So, right, so again, so so the we're looking at the the like the game theoretical analogy to statistical mechanics where you have thermal fluctuations and that would be this end level noise introspection then we uh, just look at so in this talk we looked at a particular simple model which where we can calculate things and it's actually rich enough that we can see a couple of nice phenomena and that would be the what we call the easing game uh, right so then still it's, things are a bit Interesting. So, like, right, so on, uh, on like in the physical one D easing model, the 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 easing game actually has a phase transition at some non-zero temperature. And so, so that is a phenomenon that happens in game theory that is not happening in physics. And uh, even weirder is that this is a zero order transition, a phase transition that definitely is not happening in these physical models. And uh, so this is this is weird. Uh, right. So and then uh, yeah. So the other thing is right. So, so if there's no external stimulus, right, and they just play the game once, everyone is just playing randomly plus or minus one. But perfectly rational players would be able to perfectly align by the next run of the game. Uh, uh, but yeah. So uh, less less than perfectly rational players will. Uh, will align less or will have less probability of, of aligning as well as if they don't have enough infinite time to do this infinite uh, computation. Right? Um, but, and yeah, so this above is true that they kind of are getting closer to alignment unless they pass a critical amount of, of noise and then they just will not align by the second round at all. Uh, yeah, and that's about it, that's my time. Uh, that's really cool. Uh, it's, it's, it's so nice to see this. Uh, I, I was going to ask you a, a basic question, which I, I didn't want to interrupt uh, earlier, but I'm just uh, trying to think, like, how do I map this onto a situation in Filecoin? Uh, and the thing I'm kind of wondering about is here, there's an, there's an assumption of locality, right? So like, what is like a mapping between like things I care about in Filecoin to? I mean, let's let's, of locality. Can I, can I, let, let's reduce it a bit to to let's reduce it to Bitcoin maybe, which is a bit less. I mean, <laughs> in a sense that that I mean, it's a simple thing. I want let's, let's say I want to make transactions and pay for these transactions, right? So, uh, right. So, so what? Bitcoin is trying to accomplish with an ex external incentive is to get 
Right, so they introduced this incentive that is artificially motivating people to do this. Right, so it's, it's motivating validators to validate transactions and, and motivates people to, to use right, so, uh, what But kind of this incentive is going away. Right, so in in the end, so, so what we would like is for it to be a stable point where it would be a good strategy for people to make to do these exchanges naturally where people are making their transactions and paying validators transaction fees for for that. So people were not doing this. I mean, people could have done this with, a, I mean, so it's kind of IPFS versus Falcon, right? So, so, uh, so Falcon existed, people could, uh, sorry, IPFS existed. People could have started making kind of a deals for to store data, okay, store my data and I'll give you money for it and, and so on but they are not naturally doing it. So can I, first, can I push them to do it? Right, so, so can I align, so, so this is, I mean, this is of course a, a very, very simple toy model where we're talking about plus and one, but naturally those plus and ones are just being a plus and minus one or not aligning. I introduced this external incentive to make it, make them align, so let's say, they could be doing those those transactions and paying for them, or they could not be doing that, right? But I want to push them to do that. Right? So I introduce this incentive, and I push the people to make this transaction market to make this data storage market. But I would like to for this to be stable if I remove that incentive also. Right? So, and, uh, right? so, so this is kind of the question. So I mean, first thing is that yeah, so people are not perfectly rational so so i mean there will be some level of noise so the question is i introduce these incentives in in bitcoin that make people make these transactions i uh, introduce these incentives in, in falcon that make people do uh data materials and, and so on uh will it be stable if i remove those incentives right so can i use the incentives to kind of push people to do a desired activity and then remove the incentive and they will keep doing that. Or if I remove the incentive, just the irrational noise will be too strong to destroy this and people will just stop using Bitcoin and Falcon and the incentives go away. So, so, so is the graph over which the sun runs, is this between storage providers or is it between storage providers and their clients? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I guess, uh, so, so for this case, it's quite yeah, like kind of Bitcoin is easier problem because there's fewer things you can do, right? So you would have people that want to make transactions and people that would, right? so, so, so different. So you have two different kinds of players that want different things. So, so it's more complicated because you have two different types of utilities. Right? So validators, so validators would benefit from this artificial incentive plus from transaction fees, right? And and people who want to send transactions will benefit from the value that it has to them to send that transaction because they consider that value minus the transaction cost. Right? So they will right, so they will do that if if what they value that transaction is higher than what it costs them. Right? So, um, right. So kind of this like so block reward is so I have these two two types of 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 utilities interacting and block reward is something that distort is distorting what is the best thing for people to do so in a way so block reward distorts the validator utility function and that okay I, I, i'm gonna do this even if i if people aren't paying me because i'm just getting this external reward when they do that they are actually free to lower their transaction fees right because i'm getting block reward so i'll i'll just validate for nothing right so then that affects the the other users, you know. Okay, so 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 transaction costs are lower, so I can, yeah, this I, it's worth it to me to send this transaction. But if I say if I remove the block reward, it, it those effect propagates everywhere. And there, so so even if 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 at that point that that the effect propagates everywhere, even if players were, uh, so even if it would if it would be the best thing to keep using this transaction system. Maybe just a little bit of irrationality will push it to not being the best system. 
Uh, okay, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was just going to ask one other question very quickly. So, like, one, one the really interesting result seems to be if if I understood correctly, if you've got something at finite temperature and you apply some incentive field to align people's behavior, that's fine. And then you take away that incentive field, you're saying the the system will remain polarized. Is that that right? Yeah. So that so, is. So I mean, for this, we like, the moment. Should, should we take away any like practical ideas for this? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, the, the ideal thing is, okay, so, so what the eventual thing of this, okay, so we'll formulate an actual model of Bitcoin or whatever, where we have these utilities of, of users and these utilities of, uh, of uh, validators, and we'll try to formulate it in a way like this. But I mean, that's a more complicated model than plus or minus one, but... Uh, uh, but, but there seems to be something saying there that if you apply incentives temporarily, this can be effective in the long term. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, over -interpreting. so yeah, it's over interpreting that this is okay. A simple model says that, but it's encouraging, and that uh, simple model says that. So, so it's kind of cool. That's a, the best I can say is kind of cool. And it's also, I mean, what is kind of cooler is that this is even stronger than in physics. Right? So, because in the in the one D uh, physical leasing model, this is not stable upon removing the external field. Right? But uh, kind of this introspection thing is more the stable point, uh, the stable phase is more stable than in the statistical mechanics. So that's that's encouraging for these simple uh, uh, models. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's nice. I'm, I'm not gonna say statements about what that means for Falcon or Bitcoin, but uh, but it's encouraging that it gives a hope that oh maybe maybe crypto economics can work. So that, <laughs> that's kind of the 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 outcome here. Yeah, it's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. And by the way, that's crypto economics. It's J. Crypto economics is J. <laughs> to, to turn this into a crypto econ talk. Yeah, I mean by J I mean this external incentive. Crypto economics done. This is crypto economics. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So this to extend the analogy further, this is like um, like applying a magnetic field, but what about if we dope the system? Or like, is there any other ways we can warp the field? I mean, how how, how do we extend this? Analogy? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, I mean, there's as many things to modify this. I mean, what my criteria here was like was the simplest thing I can think of, and then let's see if that's calculable, and and hopefully that's rich enough to so, show me something cool. And I was lucky that it was, but uh, of course we can keep complicating this and. We can add next to nearest neighbors. We can add uh, in homogeneity, right? So like the values of this constant can be different side by side and things like this. Uh, yeah, many things. We can add different types of utilities. Um, so. We can add higher dimensions also. So this, this can also be done. I align all the players in a line, but you can also do a, a 2D and a, yeah. it's actually uh, not. Yeah. I, I'd really like to see this for like a token version. So if you insert some agents who have a fixed polarization and they're almost always aligned in a certain way, how mm -hmm. does that affect the, the state globally of the whole system um, mm -hmm. in this kind of introspective recursive thing? That would be like a really interesting thing as well. Yeah. Anyway, enough okay. for me. That sounds probably doable. Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so it's a very simple model, but I mean, there shouldn't be a phase transition between this and Falcon. <laughs> so it's like, uh, uh, I want to have a more complicated model accounting for the difference, but, but this is, this could, this is, this is a formalism that you could use to understand the, the Falcon thing, uh, but uh, with a much more complicated model that you're not going to be able to solve exactly like this one. But, uh, I mean, the same is true in physics, like the using physicists really like the using model because you can play a lot with it, but real uh, systems you want to describe can be a lot more complicated than the using model, but uh, that doesn't stop people from first trying to understand the using model. All right, looks like we're about at time. I can stop the recording unless anybody else has any further questions.
Good stuff. Thanks so much, Axel. Very interesting. Thank you.